Good morning. I have a few announcements of things happening in the life of our church over the next couple of weeks. Tomorrow, Purses in the Pew will welcome Reverend Julie Long. Julie is the Assistant Director of Baptist Women in Ministry National. If you would like to join us, please let me know ASAP so I can have lunch for you. We are having a family night at Wargo's Pumpkin Patch this afternoon from 4 to 6 p.m. for our children. Please feel free to come and join us even if you have not registered. You will just meet us there. There will be a youth ministry team meeting at 5 p.m. this afternoon in the youth room. Senior adults will meet for uh, breakfast at Cracker Barrel this Wednesday at 9 a.m. for their bi-monthly breakfast. And the youth are having a lock-in this coming Friday at Sky Zone. There are more details on cost and how to register on our website. There are several other activities happening in the month of November for our senior adults, our women's ministry, and other church-wide events. Please go to our challenge or our website and check that out and sign up for what you can join us for. Now may we join our hearts and minds for worship.
Two weeks ago, we began our Job worship series with communion, acknowledging that we bring all of who we are, the good and the bad, from the very beginning of our lives to the very end of our lives, to meet all of who God is in the broken body and shed blood represented in the communion elements. We bring all of who we are to meet all of who God is to this place right here. All of who we are in birth, all of who we are in marriage, all of who we are in ordination, all of who we are even in death, all of who we are in confession and repentance, all of who we are and all we have to celebrate and all we have to grieve, all of who we are as an offering to a God who gives us all of who God is. And as we talked about Job, we said that that meant that we brought our brokenness down here to this place too. That we brought our grief and our despair and our resignation and our loneliness and our, and our hurt. Central Baptist Church member Carol Harless is a sculptor whose works include these three sculptures featured in worship this morning. Physical representations of resignation and grief and despair each brought to the cross as an offering. I'm grateful for the offering of her talent this morning as we each offer our whole selves to God in worship. Good morning and welcome to worship at Central Baptist Church. I am glad that each of you is here. As we continue to worship this morning, I invite you to join me in reading our call to worship responsibly. God, you call each of us to serve you, and we answer. Here we are. We are willing. Jesus, you call each of us to follow you, and we answer. Here we are. We are willing. Holy Spirit, you call each of us to worship you this day, and we answer. Here we are. We are open to your presence. Take from us all that hinders our hearing your voice. And fill us anew that we respond to your call on our lives. May we hear the voice of God who shepherds us with love and grace.
Please join me in the litany with selected verses from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Voice, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare, and in his, his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Our scripture reading today comes from Psalm 104, verses 1 through 9. Hear these words from God for us. Praise the Lord, my soul. O oh Lord, my God, how great you are. You are clothed with majesty and glory. You cover yourself with light. You have spread out the heavens like a tent and built your home on the waters above. You use the clouds as your chariot and ride on the wings of the wind. You use the winds as your messengers and flashes of lightning as your servants. You have set the earth firmly on its foundations and it will never be moved. You placed the oceans over it like a robe and the water covered the mountains. When you rebuked the waters, they fled. They rushed away when they heard the shout of your command, and they flowed over the mountains and into the valleys to the place you had made for them. You set a boundary they can never pass to keep them from covering the earth again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And as we've heard God's word, let us seek him in prayer. Oh God, how great you are. How could we ever forget that truth? We clothe ourselves this morning in our Sunday best because you are clothed with majesty and glory and are full of light. And our goal is to become more like you. Remind us that our outer garments are useless if we are not radiating your goodness and love from the inside out. You call your followers to be the light of the world, shining the light of truth and love and compassion into a world darkened by deceit and power and apathy. Open our eyes to those who, like Job, are suffering and sitting in the silence, waiting desperately to hear something, anything from you, O oh God, because your word is life. Forgive us when we become so lost in ourselves that we forget to care for the least and the vulnerable among us. Forgive us when we're more concerned with being right than with what is right. And you have shown us what that requires, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, O oh God. In the name of our most just, merciful, and humble Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord, help us to be generous givers, both of our money and our lives, that we might make a difference in our world. We ask this through your son, Jesus, who gave all that he was, that we may know life in all of its fullness. Amen.
Can I have the boys and girls join me in the front? And we're going to mix it up a little and come to this side for me. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. All right, so last week we talked about a game, the quiet game, right? Do you all remember that? Maybe. This week we're going to, I'm going to see if you know another kind of game. Raise your hand if you've ever played 20 questions. I bet you have with your parents and didn't even realize it. But the rules to this actual game is that one person will come up with a person, place, or a thing in their brain, and then the other person gets 20 questions to try and figure out what they're thinking about, right? So it's a pretty fun game. Maybe you should play it with your parents after church today. You're welcome. <laughs> so um, asking questions, though, is something that we all do. Little children who are just starting to talk, they usually ask the question, why, over and over again. And as we grow, the curiosity continues into bigger questions. Even adults have lots of questions. Asking questions is the best way to learn something, right, if you don't know it. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about Job. Do you all remember that? We talked about Job the last two weeks. The first week, we talked about how Job had a very horrible, no good, very bad day, week, year, a long time, it seemed like for him. And then last week, we talked about how Job was trying to find God. He was asking uh, God questions, and God seemed to really be uh, not answering, didn't seem to be anywhere. He couldn't find God. God was very quiet. This week, a little later in Job's story, we're talking about when God finally speaks to Job. And it's not the answer Job thought he was going to get. Through God's answer, God is trying to tell Job that no matter what happens, God is powerful, bigger, better than anything in the world. He created the world. He knows everything. God is wise. He's all-knowing. God did hear Job speaking, and God does hear us speaking. So even if God doesn't answer every question we have, we can be comforted to know that God does know everything, God is listening to us, and God is here with us. We might not hear God like Job did, because we don't hear him speaking to us, but we do know that God speaks to us through other people, or maybe by giving us a feeling or something in our mind that God wants us to know. So I want you to do two things for me this week. I want you to think about what question you would ask God if God was right in front of you. And if you ask that question, how you would feel if God answered you right then and there. Just something to think about through this week. What would you ask God and how would it feel if all-knowing, all-powerful God answered you? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for being everywhere all the time. I pray you will find ways to speak to each of these children so that they know your power and goodness are always with them. Amen.
Thank you, Claudia, for joining us at Central this morning, and thank you for all that you've added to our worship. Carol Shriver is a, a world-renowned astrophysicist, and his wife, Iris, is a professor of pathology at Stanford University. Carol spends his days and presumably his nights staring up into the heavens, uh, and Iris spends her days trying to figure out how the human body fights off diseases in her work as a as a pathologist. A few years ago, this, this husband and wife duo combined their respective fields of expertise to write a book, a book called Living with the Stars, How the Human Body is Connected to the Life Cycles of the Earth, the Planets, and the Stars. And they explain in the book, in a way that ordinary people like you and me can understand, that we are all literally made of stardust. That cosmic clouds of intergalactic dust are literally the building blocks of the universe. Talking about the book they wrote together, the wife, Iris, says, Everything we are, and everything in the universe, and everything on earth originated from stardust, and it continually floats through us even today. It directly connects us to the universe, rebuilding our bodies over and again over our lifetime. She goes on to say that was one of the biggest surprises for us in this book. We really didn't realize how impermanent we were. Every few years, the bulk of our bodies are newly created as residual stardust finds its way into our soil and then into our plants and then into the food we eat and then into our bodies giving us everything we need to think, to move, to grow. Every few years, the bulk of our bodies are newly created. It gives a whole new meaning to what God says in Revelation, right? Behold, I make all things new. I grew up in the, in the royal ambassadors, the RAs, as a child growing up in a, in a Baptist church. The royal ambassadors were a, a Southern Baptist Wednesday night missions program for boys that kind of combined a missions education with something kind of like the Cub Scouts. As, as a royal ambassador, one, one year, maybe in the third or fourth grade, we took a trip. Our, our royal ambassador group took a trip to watch a meteor shower together. I don't remember exactly where we went, but I remember that it was on a, on a fall night and we drove way out into the country as far away from city lights as we could get. I remember sitting on the ground out in the country, third grader, underneath the stars. I guess someone, while we, as we were there, kind of knew which direction we were supposed to face, like where we were supposed to look in the sky to, to see the meteors. And we sat in the grass, and we looked up into the darkness, and we waited. You can imagine just how patient a group of third grade boys might be, sitting, sitting still in the dark, quietly even, waiting for something to happen. It didn't take long at all for us to start to complain, to start to ask our leaders when we'd see something. Where are all these meteors? Why did we drive out here into the middle of nowhere? When is it going to start? And then something happened. Three meteors, bright as day in the night sky, looking so close that you could just reach out and touch them. Three meteors streaked flat and straight as an arrow from left to right, right across in front of us. Kids all around me, my friends, let out shrieks of excitement. They pointed at where the meteors had been, but I'd missed it. <laughs> I wasn't looking in the right direction, or maybe I, was, maybe I was looking down at the grass. I don't know, but I didn't see them. I didn't see the meteors, so... So I redoubled my efforts to focus only on the sky and in the area they had been pointing. I resolved to not even blink until I, until I saw something. And before long, it happened again, just like the first time. Three streaks of light perfectly in sync running right across in front of us. We all shouted and we pointed again. Then it happened again. And again, just in exactly the same way, in fact, the same meteors kept streaking across the sky in just exactly the same way with such regularity that eventually even our third grade minds began to suspect that something wasn't quite right. <laughs> <laughs> it 
one of our leaders, one of the adults on the trip with us, had one of those super powerful flashlights. And we were sitting in the grass looking across the road that we'd come in on. And on the opposite side of the road ran a set of power lines. And on a dark night, if you were to take a relatively powerful flashlight and just streak it across the power lines like that, you could make it look like there were meteors. You could make some pretty convincing fake meteors, convincing at least to third graders, at least for a little while. I'll admit to being both fooled and, and disappointed once we finally caught on. Disappointed, that is, until the real meteors started showing up. Streaking across the sky, some big, some small, some shooting up, some shooting down, some you caught just barely out of the corner of your eye, some were right there in the middle of your, of your field of vision. And some of the dust lit by the fire of those meteors as they burned into our atmosphere from millions and millions and millions of miles away. Some of that dust settled into our soil or settled into our oceans, became the nutrients for our crops or food for our fish. <laughs> and we sit down at our tables and eat it off of our plates. <laughs> And it becomes part of us. <laughs> we are literally stardust. <laughs> Most of us, I think, have experienced the feeling of smallness when we stand on the shore of the ocean and we stare up at the night sky. Maybe when we look down from a high mountain peak. <laughs> it's not just a feeling of smallness we experience, is it? <laughs> That feeling of being, of being lost in the size and the scope of time and, and space isn't just a feeling of smallness. It's a feeling of connectedness, too, of cosmic connectedness, of awe, of oneness with the natural world and even oneness with our Creator. This is week three of our Job series. We've been talking about the the experience of grief and loss and struggle in life, of, of despair and, and resignation. Last week, Job took all of that, all of that that he had experienced, all of his grief and all of his despair, he took all of it and he gathered it up as a shouted offering to God. And we acknowledged in response to Job's shouted offering. We acknowledge the reality of God's silence. God's seeming absence in our lives, especially God's silence when we feel like we need to hear from God the most. We left Job last week waiting to hear from God. Job has suffered a tremendous loss, and, and somehow in that loss he's managed to maintain his, his faithfulness. He's been as faithful as he knows how to be, and Job has some good friends who want to help him through his grief, just like we have good friends who would help us in our grief. They each offer their own advice about how, how Job can get through a challenging time. We know that Job's friends mean well, just like our friends have meant well in our lives, but they, what they offer to Job is less than satisfactory. It's less than what Job expects from God. Job's three friends each, a, each approach him with one kind of conventional wisdom or another. It's a, it's a blend of theology and, and pop psychology. The kind of thing you might expect to hear from Dr. Phil on TV. But to Job's credit, <laughs> Job doesn't accept the Dr. Phil version, right? Job holds out for the real thing. He's waiting to hear a real word from God, Job is. <laughs> but he's at the end of his rope. God has been silent. Job says, I need a God who speaks and a God who listens. My arguments are reasonable. My cause is just. <laughs> Finally, Job shouts into the void and with his last bit of determination says, Let the Almighty answer me. And then something amazing happens. God speaks. God speaks to Job. 
And this is what God says. This is from Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this darkening counsel with words lacking knowledge? Prepare yourself like a man. I will interrogate you and you will respond to me, God says to Job. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you know. Who set its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring tape on it? On what were its footings sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? Job? Who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang in unison? And all the divine beings shouted. What does an experience of God feel like? What is it like to be in the presence of the real Holy One? When we talk about God or or sing about God, we, we say things like King of kings and Lord of lords, God of all creation, God of earth, sea, and sky, all powerful, all knowing, ever present. We say those things. But those are just words, just words without definition or meaning until God appears, until God actually speaks. And in Job, God speaks at just the right time. It's a a dramatic moment in the text. The author of Job builds the tension of the story to, to an unsustainable level, just to an absolute breaking point. Just as we know the cord is about to snap or the balloon is about to burst, just as we know that Job is is about to lose it entirely, God speaks. So to those of us, to those of you, waiting for God to speak, to those of us who have been sitting in silence for too long, or filling the void with our own shouted petitions. <laughs> can seem like God has missed his moment. <laughs> can seem like your abandonment is complete. It felt that way to Job too. But God does speak. What is it that God says? God says, you want a God who listens and a God who speaks? Someone who comes down from the heights of the universe to look you in the eye? Well, here I am. You asked for me and now you've got me. And the very first thing God says is, I've been listening to you. I have heard your complaint. What is it that we want to hear most from God in the depths of our doubt and struggle? I've been listening. I've been listening, God says, but your understanding is incomplete. You don't have all the facts yet. And then God starts asking questions to illustrate his point. Job, where were you when the foundation of the earth was laid? Who stretched out the measuring tape from end to end? Who who made sure the corners were square? Who dug the footings? Who placed the cornerstone? Where were you when I established order out of chaos? Do you know what happened then? I, I remember it well. If you can believe it, Job, the stars sang when I did that. The angels shouted in the heavens. It was majestic, God says. You don't have a large enough perspective, God says, but I do.
And how does Job respond to God's questions? Does Job respond with continued shouts and and accusations? Does he reiterate his argument and demand answers? Once God appears, once God speaks, Job simply responds, I am small. I'm small. And then he covers his mouth, refusing to speak even one more word. What does it mean when we when we cover our mouths. <laughs> Modern body language experts will tell you that it can be a way that we register shock or surprise. <laughs> but in the Bible, when people cover their mouths, it's always out of shame. <laughs> we cover our mouths when we've been exposed. <laughs> Children do it when they've been caught doing something wrong. Covering our mouths is a natural reaction to an overwhelming experience of vulnerability. It's what we do. (laughs) What does it feel like to be in the presence of the Holy One? (laughs) Job says, I am small. And he covers his mouth. I am small, God. You are great. That's what an experience of God feels like. Small and vulnerable and connected. When God speaks, it's not what we expect. It wasn't what Job expected. Instead, it's what we need. When we've been asking hard questions out of hard experiences in life, questions like why, or how is this fair, or where is the justice in this? When we've been asking hard questions that don't have easy answers, God gives us some questions that we know the answers to. Who is it that causes the meteors to shine in the eyes of third graders? God asks. I know the answer to that one. Who is it that gathers dust from among the stars and causes it to rain down on your pastures? And we know the answer. Who is it that puts nutrients from from distant galaxies on the plate sets your dinner tables. Who does that? Who is it that continually makes you new? We know the answers to those questions. They make me feel small, even vulnerable. And I cover my mouth feeling awesomely connected as I realize that the God who holds the stars holds me too. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we we long to hear you speak. We admit that the the experience that we are longing for is one that overwhelms us. We admit our vulnerability in your presence. But we rely on our connectedness. We rely on your perspective. We rely on your justice and your mercy and your love. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We don't end services at Central without giving you a chance to respond to what God might be doing in your life or or in your heart, if there's a way that you would respond publicly this morning, maybe by choosing this morning as the morning that you would give your, your life over to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the very first time, I would invite you to make that decision publicly. Or maybe this is the morning that you want to join Central Baptist Church in an official way as a member. Uh, you can make that decision as well by meeting me here at the front as we sing our departing hymn together. I told the folks in the early service it's been a year or maybe even a little bit more since I first had the chance to let Carol Harless walk me through her gallery and tell me about her work. And when I saw these pieces, they just immediately made an impression on me. And I looked at her and I said, if we ever get around to preaching Job, I'd love you to let us use these in worship one Sunday. And I want to thank her for letting me follow through on that request. Thank all of you as well for being present in worship this morning. I hope we all leave this hour of worship encouraged and emboldened to be faithful representatives both of this church and of our Lord Jesus Christ. I invite all of you to bow with me now for our benediction. Depart now in peace and as you go, may the God who makes all things holy and whole make you holy and whole. Put you together spirit, soul, and body and keep you fit for the coming of our Master Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.